Hello, welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name is Toby, and today I'm joined by Danielle Ospina and Dr. Judith Ungvari. Danielle is a science officer at Future Earth, an organisation which supports collaboration and networking among researchers in the broad area of sustainability science. He oversees the 10 New Insights in Climate Science series and is also part of the Earth Commission Secretariat, both of which are hosted at Future Earth. His background is in socio-environmental studies. And Judith is also an ecologist with a PhD in zoology. She now co-leads Future Earth's research and innovation portfolio and is based at the Institute for a Sustainable Earth of George Mason University, Virginia. So, Danielle and Judith, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thank you. Before we get into the main part of today's conversation, I want to ask you about this, for me anyway, slightly confusing matrix of employers and organisations that you both work for that all seem to have quite similar names. So you both work at Future Earth and you did, you're did. you based in the Institute for Sustainable Earth. And I just mentioned, Daniel, because you told me to, that you're part of the Secretariat of the Earth Commission, which is hosted by Future Earth. And I did not mention, even though you did tell me to, that this is part in turn of the Global Commons Alliance. And I think there's only so many times I can hear the words Earth and globe and world before my brain starts to shut down. So please, could you tidy it up for me? So Future Earth is a global network of networks with hubs around the world. And many of these hubs are hosted by different institutions. And these hubs are also hosting institutions within. So the network of networks is diverse. The hosting countries are diverse. And so are the institutions. Sometimes it's a national academy. Sometimes it's an NGO. Sometimes it's multiple universities coming together that are hosting these entities. So for example, for my case, I am housed at a university in the United States, and I'm part of the U.S. Global Hub. But my colleague, Danielle, is in Sweden, and they have a totally different formation. Yeah, so, so in case uh, the case of the Sweden Hub of Future Earth, it is, it is legally a foundation, and we are physically at the Royal Academy of Sciences. And if, I, if you want me to continue with the Earth Commission, another big uh, hard thing to explain. But yeah, so the Earth Commission is, is a large collaboration of, of scientists working in interdisciplinarily to uh, assess the literature and uh, quantify what we call safe and just boundaries. So basically limits within societies should stay for the Earth to remain stable and to minimize the impact on societies. But the Earth Commission is the scientific foundation of a larger collaboration called the Global Commons Alliance, which has that scientific base, but has uh, the science-based targets network. It has accountability accelerator. It has different components, all kind of working together to bring science into action for global sustainability. All right. Thank you very much for that. So by the sound of it, we're going to zoom in quite considerably for our conversation today from these big global collaborations down into looking at one particular piece of work called 10 New Insights, which is your territory, Daniel. So what is this series? Yeah, so I've been coordinating the 10 New Insights in Climate Science since 2022, and it has been going since 2017. And what it is, it's an annual synthesis of climate science uh, going across uh, natural science and social science uh, with high policy relevance. So it is an effort on science synthesis, but also science communication, because our target audience is primarily negotiators at the UNFCCC, but also policymakers working at other levels. Right. And UNFCCC is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And can I jump in for a second? Yeah, of course. I think it's important to note that 10 New Insights is one of the most influential and repeated long-lasting outputs and products that Future Earth produces every year. And it is a huge effort of collaborations globally from various scientists, from community members, and on the secretariat's end as well. There is a lot of hands that are collaborating, putting this together. Yes, and I think it, it's also sometimes... A useful way to explain it, get more uh, concrete on what Future Earth does, because it is it is an uh, an initiative that is led by the Secretariat, so like you did and myself, but it tends to connect a lot of researchers from from the network. So you did said it's like the largest network of sustainability scientists, 
And sometimes it's unclear what that means. That means we have uh, projects that have been running uh, often longer, much longer than Future Earth, like the Global Carbon Project, uh, ILIP, SOLAS, working on different uh, aspects of the Earth systems. And we can kind of connect to specific scientists working on these different networks and invite them to participate on the, on the report, depending on the topics that are featured every year. In fact, they are invited openly and they volunteer their time and they come in and they provide their expertise. They collaborate with colleagues from around the globe that are not part of their networks. But this initiative allows them to reach outside and create this product that is a collaboration across all of these different networks coming together, but kind of focusing on these 10 new insights that are the distillation of all the inputs that are coming in from many different community members. Okay. And it's 10 insights about climate science intended for these negotiators at the UNFCCC. Why 10? Uh, honestly, I think it was not for any better reason than it's a round, nice number. So that very first report in 2017, it was actually called, if I'm correct, the 10 science must knows. So uh, I, I guess the context was this, this uh, geopolitical complicated moment with the White House saying they were going to step out of the Paris Agreement, uh, but also the IPCC reports having come uh, at that point already three years. And uh, so several years have passed and kind of science starts kind of being a bit silent in the, in the climate negotiations. So the organizers of, uh, of this initiative, they thought we just, we want to raise the attention to some, to some of the most important uh, advances, the, most, uh, the key messages from, science on, uh, from climate science and raise it again to the attention of, of negotiators. So they just got like 10 things that are very important. As I said, like spanning very physical, geophysical science and, and more uh, mitigation aspects, health aspects. So I think that's the reason. Uh, why then? Yeah, okay. So must knows. This implies 10 things the climate negotiators really must know, must bear in mind if they're going to do their job well. Yeah, this is something they sh really shouldn't forget. It should be very present on their minds when they're doing their very important work. And then what happened is that that uh, report was very successful. So it got a lot of attention. It was very praised by the different parts. So they thought, the organizers thought, why don't we make this an annual report? And it's justified very well as a complement to the IPCC, given what I already referred to, that the IPCC takes so long. It's every cycle takes something like six or seven years. There's quite some gap in between. And even when the IPCC just came, like last year, we released a 10 New Insights report, and we also had a synthesis report of the IPCC. But that synthesis report has had a cutoff date of, ref of uh, literature that they have reviewed, like from 2021. So while we are providing much smaller, of course, much more limited review, but with a time resolution that is complementary to the IPCC, we think. How on earth can you possibly boil down everything you need to know about climate science, or at least everything that's new about climate science, into these 10 insights? Like, what's the process for doing that? Yeah. So obviously it is not... The, all the, this is all the climate science that has uh, been advanced in last year. It's obviously a selection. It's obviously limited in, in kind of, it has its own bias given the group that we are, uh, given the institutions that we're based on. But we try to reduce that as much as possible by having the, as broad a base as we can. Here's again where the networks of Future Earth, but also our partners, WCRP and the Earth League come in very handy because they are in all cases global networks. We make a call for expert input that goes at the beginning of the year. And we receive the suggestions of topics. So we basically ask them exactly that question. What do you think in your area of expertise in climate change is, is very important that you think should be raised to the attention of policymakers? It's really how we... Okay, and it's really as open as that. You don't start by saying, these are the topics we think are most interesting, which experts can talk no. about them. No. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so as I say, like, it's the only way that we can... Um, minimize the limitation of our own biases by having a broadest and most diverse base. Uh, we do complement that with a literature scan. Uh, so the core team, the people that are really working throughout the year in this, we all kind of go and look into the most important uh, uh, journals in climate change, identify papers that have been very impactful and make sure to include them in that list. But then it's up to the editorial board, which is the other key element of the process, 
to they, they are presented with all these uh, suggestions and then they deliberate and prioritize through a series of workshops. And that's how we come up with the 10 at the end. So it's a top-down, bottom-up effort, working together, gathering the information from the community with this open question, but then having a lot of work done to enable the editorial board's deliberations by the secretariat that is working on it. And then the expertise of the editorial board really help in that prioritization. And there too, as, as Daniel said, biases can come in, but we are talking about a big mechanism that is supporting this with global networks and scientists from various different disciplines. And I use the word scientists. Some of those people probably don't even identify as scientists, but they are experts or practitioners in that field who are bringing together these insights that they think are going to be the most influential ones. Yeah, very good. And this is done every year, so it must be done fairly quickly, I guess. I mean, turning around from the start of the year when you're saying, okay, what should go in this thing, all the way to being able to provide it in a coherent form within 12 months. That's pretty ambitious, given the scale and given the amount of expertise that's involved. Yeah, that's the craziest thing. So every time I'm confronted with the timeline, thinking this, how is this going to work? We are, we haven't, we barely have celebrated the, the launch of, of one and we already have to start working on the next one. And this is always kind of uh, compounded with realizations from discussions with the stakeholders, for example. We have had these stakeholder dialogues to figure out new ways to make the report more impactful. And the conclusions of that are always like, oh, could you uh, launch it earlier? <laughs> so everything, it's even calls to make it even faster. <laughs> but yeah, it is, it is very quick. And I think the only reason why it works is because, um, well, we are, it's a very dedicated group of people from the, all the collaborating partners to make it happen. And we have been hammering that timeline year after year. It always improves so much. And uh, so we know, yeah, when we have to start doing um, everything. <laughs> Um, as early as possible, we, we anticipate what will be needed. Just to, to make the timeline even trickier, since I think 2020, it's not just the report, but we produce the report is, um, is constructed on top of an academic paper. So we submit an academic paper, and then on top of that, we take that content and we rework it for the, a different audience. So the, the paper is mostly for other researchers, that want to have a better sense of what is going on in different areas of climate change research. But uh, that allows us first to gather the energy of all the researchers because then they're working for an academic publication. But uh, at the end also allows us to say, okay, this report is also is, is all grounded in a, in a paper that has been peer reviewed. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you can say to the policymakers, this is legit, it's peer reviewed, it's in literature, it's the real deal. Yes, yeah, two advantages because it also motivates people when we... Uh, I, I, I described the process to you from the call for input, then the prioritization by the editorial board. But then the next step is also tricky and essential is we have the 10 topics and we uh, recruit experts to make a little team for each of the insights. And they have a few months, <laughs> uh, less than three months, to write down a short blurb. What is the insight? What is the science? And why is it important? And, and start uh, hinting on what is the, the policy relevance? And to get them to make the time to work on this text so quickly, then it is much easier if there is a publication at the end of it. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so okay, a few questions. But the first one is, how long are these short blurbs? How much are they writing for each? Each insight? of the teams write something like a thousand words. Okay. So in the end, it's it's only like a few pages. It's not an enormous report. Yeah, it's a, it's regular size uh, peer review paper. Yeah. And these people are unpaid. Unpaid. Yes, it's all voluntary work. Yeah, so they do it out of the goodness of their hearts. It's interesting then that you say that you find it useful to motivate them by saying, uh, don't worry, it's not just a major global political impact helping to shape the future of the world. You also get your name on an academic paper. <laughs> yes. yeah. I think, yeah, I think it goes to different motivations. I think many of them, maybe all of them, are also find it exciting and, and important that it's going to be then launched at, at the COP or it's going to be received by the executive secretary, all of these things. It, it does motivate them, but uh, sometimes also they need to, to justify it a bit maybe more in their institutions. And, and, you know, the metrics being so related with academic publications, a report doesn't count <laughs> often. I don't know if always, but it seems like not always. So a paper makes it just easier for them. 
yeah, they, they, they see it more straightforward. But I, I do think that in the end, for most of them, the, the report and all the work that we do in the second part of the year towards copies is actually more exciting. But the peer-reviewed journal article is still the currency for most of the community members. And especially if uh, you are working with early career researchers who do need to build their CVs, for them, having both a report as well as a peer-reviewed journal article with that citation and digital object identifier out there is very valuable. Yeah. And then on the audience side, your target is UN level, so global level climate negotiators, which is a pretty ambitious target audience. Uh, you said it was well received in 2017, you know, and, and I believe you. But how about since then? Is there still the interest? Is there still the demand? Are people waiting with bated breath for each year's publication? And also, do they use it? You know, do they use it in the room? I, this is so hard to, to measure. I would like to know more about how we can measure this properly. There are certain things that we we take as as uh, positive signs. So some some things just very explicit. What uh, heads of negotiation, for example, uh, the Swedish head of negotiation last year said something very complimentary to the effect of, uh, "I think this report should be on on every negotiation. Like it should be part of the work that they do ahead of the COP." He also told us this should be you should come much earlier, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. as I said. And and I say this a uh, bit with a smile because. It's, yeah, they say that. We don't know. We hope there is some kernel of truth there. But uh, yeah, there's other things. It's just also how much the recordings of the press conference are watched. There, there are some kind of hard numbers there that we can try to infer what it means that the, that the press conference is watched so many times. I think also in a couple of years, it has been the most watched according in the, in the UNFCCC platform. And we have heard that from partners as well. So the are the organizations um, that are working on 10 new insights beside Future Earth are also valuing this report and using it both in its printed form as well as pointing to the website and asking their stakeholders to take a look, check it out. Because the report is, is that journal article. It is that report that goes out. It is also a really nice website that you can click on and explore. So the uh, reach of it can go to anyone. It's really a public document. Um, it's perhaps not necessarily written with all the audiences in mind, but then there are various ways of sharing the information from it. And I know that, for example, I believe in 2021, a couple of years ago, that website received the most clicks out of all of the different pages in Future Earth's various website because it was just so accessible and easy and nice to explore these little bits of information, as, as Daniel said, they are blurbs, they are digestible, um, and you can capture it and walk away with some easy information for your memo that you're writing, or maybe the latest information that you want to know from that particular year. Yeah. I mean, as a comms person, that, uh, that's good to hear. And I've also learned in recent years that there's a second very important motivation for wanting to make one scientific advice public and easily digestible, which is that that's another route in itself to reach policy. If you can have your NGOs and your lobbyists and your voters waving your report saying, look at this, you should be following it, that's quite an effective way to influence policy too. Yeah, that was actually a realization for me in, in this two years of the, at, at first I thought like, we're just not clear of what is our target audience. We say that it's the policymakers, but we put so much energy in making a nice report with beautiful figures and and think so much on the slides and and think of social media and third and first i thought that's kind of uh inconsistent but now i've i found that it makes more sense to think of it as you said two roots uh yeah it's com it's complementary we want the report to be recognized because it's useful by general public we pay a lot of attention to how the media outlets international media outlets in particular pick it up because we know that it starts becoming something that people recognize and negotiators and policymakers are also people so if they have heard of it it's also more likely that they pick it up in their work or they at least want to be aware of it but uh, it also requires other type of of efforts to reach our primary audience, which is those policymakers and negotiators. So we talk, we thought about, uh, and there's a lot of limitations with what we can do with our current budget, but uh, we want to do events that are more focused on deep dives with the negotiating teams, connecting them with experts on a particular topic that is relevant for them. Just some days ago, we had a, a conversation with a parliamentarian here in Sweden, 
And he's like, uh, it's not about convincing me. We are, there's plenty of us that are kind of on board with many of these things, but we need to strengthen our arguments to kind of to, to make them less easy to be deliberately misconstrued, blocking all the loopholes for the arguments. And this is something that I felt last year. The report had so much uh, good reception. It was part because we made, uh, we had this uh, strategic comms team uh, head, uh, led by the head of communications at Future Earth, Maya Rebermark. And we work so much with the scientists and the team of communication to really work, work, work the message. And at the end, it was nice, clear, and it had protections for all the common uh, ways in which it's dismantled, let's say. Well, that warms my heart to hear. Thank you for making me happy. <laughs> I have one more question about the content and process here, and I'm afraid it's about timings again. It strikes me that you are trying to crystallize into these 10 quote unquote new insights what is essentially a moving target. I mean, it's not like climate research stops every year in January and reports its total findings and then and then picks up again in October, right? The science must be changing even as your work is being done, even as your report's being written. Do you have a policy about what gets in and what gets left next year? And also, do you have a way in which if something major comes up after the cutoff, say in May or whatever, you can still include it? There are some strict criteria. So when we make make the call uh, for the expert uh, community, we ask them that any suggestion should be supported by at least one paper that has been published the year before. So for this one, it's published in 2023 or the this first months of 2024. Um, and then uh, people don't always do it. So then when we are screening all the entries, there's many things that, oh, this sounds very interesting, but we don't have anything completely new to say about it. And so, so we move it to the side. Yes. So basically the, the real cutoff point ends up happening for which are the topics. It happens uh, before the editorial board gets together to decide. So any topic that has been not added to the list of potentials by the time that the editorial board has their, their workshop, then that will not be considered. But new publications might come in when the teams are formed and they start working on it and they are aware of something that just came up that fits very well, then they can they can add publications. So we, and and even afterwards, uh, for the introduction uh, and for the discussion, we might include papers that come even in the in the second part of the year. Yes. So sometimes it's it's all the hot new topics, right? But sometimes it's a topic that is not the brand new one, but it has been just supported with something really relevant in the previous year or just a few months before. Yeah, and something that is the question all the time is, so what is new about this? Mm -hmm. And this is also an interesting uh, uh, kind of learning experience for me is now it's obvious, but at the moment it kind of surprised me is obviously there's no straight answer to that because it depends on the level of expertise of each people. So the experts on certain things say like, but what is new about this? And they're like frustrated. Why are you saying this? We have been talking about this for 10 years. And I'm like, yeah, but now it's it's kind of racing outside your community. And now it's uh, it maybe ripe for bringing to the policymakers. But it's not always obvious that something is, is completely new. Yeah, now that's interesting. So now I do want to ask you another one more question about this idea of e each year's insights being new. Because, OK, so in year one, as you said, it was must knows. It was these things, these things are things you should know, right? But then subsequently each year it has to be new stuff. And if you're asking the scientific community, what are the most important new things that negotiators or policymakers or society need to know there's no guarantee that scientists are going to be the best place people to think about that. They know the science, but they don't necessarily have a good perspective on policy processes, what's on the agenda, political timing, and so on. Or indeed, like you were suggesting, on what's already widely known and what isn't. How do you handle that? Is it the job of the editorial board to try and nuance the input from the scientific community to make sure it's really relevant? Yeah, certainly the editorial board plays an important role there. Uh, we also have another role in the project that I haven't mentioned is the oversight committee. Sorry to keep bringing stuff of the sort, but uh, they have a, a more long-term perspective on the project. They are the representatives of the partner organizations and they have, or they try to fit in more what seems to be important for this scope that is coming. Uh, but it's always a, a thing of tension because um, there is still a desire to keep um, the the initial spirit of these 10 musts so, uh, and that it's like scientists kind of raising the voice and saying, this is very important. So it is definitely good that it's informed by what are hot topics in climate diplomacy or, or 
issues that are going to be very, very much debated at the COP we want because that makes it more relevant, but um, not completely defined by it. Uh, so I feel it, I actually is, uh, we often get this comment that 10 is too much. And I don't know if that's where you were going with your first question, like 10 is too much. Why don't you s reduce it to three or five things? We get that from the stakeholders. Uh, and I see that point, but I think a benefit from having this 10 is it might include some stuff that is completely blindsiding everybody or most of the people. And then is, it turns out to be very important later on. Or yeah, I think a lot of the impact of this type of report, you don't, you cannot even foresee like you're you're hoping to plant some seeds somewhere make somebody realize of a reference and then it pops up later on and that we can do by having this more diverse type of messages inside there and i think one of the other elements there that really helps that yes it's a community of researchers mostly but as i said in the beginning too it, not all of them identify as researchers or scientists and also because of the nature of Future Earth being a really boundary-spanning organization and a transdisciplinary organization that includes people from all the different disciplines, even if it's majority or system scientists that are working on this particular project, that kind of perspective and that bringing in does enrich the content. And also they can bring up those things that will blindside something and saying, hey, sociologists have been talking about this for decades. Just because it's new for you, physicist, that doesn't mean maybe it should be included because of that with that historical perspective. And I think that really helps and makes it keeps it fresh too each year, hmm. even if it's if it's not the the newest and, and hot topic in the sciences. Yeah, and if I can add one more thing. It, you mentioned the editorial board. Yes, it is also very important in the editorial board. We have some people there, um, as, I, as I described initially, that they are from different disciplines, but we, we have been making a deliberate effort that we have people that are much more into the policy process, that are more aware of it, that uh, know what policies are more likely to work, but especially that are, are very much on top of what are the discussions in, in the UNFCCC. Uh, so they help us kind of connect the insights and the way that we define new insights, the criteria that we set up for them is that they have to be policy relevant. So they always can come in this in, during this workshop and saying like, this is very new, this is very important in science, but it is completely irrelevant policy-wise. So that will shift the discussion and maybe put it down, down there, or it's, or it's very tenuous, the connection. And this year, I'm very excited about this. We, we, it's an idea so far, we haven't put it in practice, but we want to have an 11th team of experts you have the scientists working on each of the, but then we have a team policy experts. These this ones that are really on top of what is the Paris Agreement? What is the UNFCCC? What is going on right now in climate diplomacy? And they read through them and point us to what, a, what is the key discussion point at the COP that this one in particularly could fit into. Right. So thanks for talking me through all that in, in such detail. I like to ask now about the other big target audience you've worked with, apart from the UN, and that's the European Commission, because you did, I gather the Commission came to you, having seen what Future Earth has done for the UNFCCC and said, we want some of that too. Is that about how it worked? I don't even think that they relied on the 10 new insights as the catalyst for coming to us. It was more about the community, future Earth, being 50,000 scientists from around the globe that are thinking about new things to do together all the time. And for the European Commission, and particularly for the Directorate of um, Climate and Biodiversity, uh, it was interesting, okay, what are these guys thinking? And uh, the ask originally was, can you come up with a report, a horizon scanning report, um, that will be just the distillation of what the experts are saying, an expert report that is focusing on the new things that they should be thinking about when it comes to the interlinkages between climate science and biodiversity. And then when we started the negotiation, we said, well, we already have this really cool method, the 10 new insights. Here are some examples of what that can produce. Is this what you're looking for? So there was a conversation going on and they said, all right, yes, we know this. This works. This is focused on climate science. Can you be broader? And we said, oh, yes, we can. Future Earth has lots of different people in it from various different perspectives and disciplines and beyond climate change and beyond biodiversity. Uh, and we can tap into all of that. And uh, 
bring something together. And we have uh, realized so many things where I know that when we were talking with Daniel about timeline, he was warning us and telling us, this is going to take a long time. This is it. And we have <laughs> short time. So we are still not done, but we are almost done. We have a final draft, a complete draft. Uh, it has been reviewed with friendly peers from the community, and we have gotten lots of comments. We have our report draft and uh, the chapters and the content and the questions, which was really what we were mandated or tasked to do, come up with research questions uh, that could become themes for funding programs down the line. So these questions are really broad. They are not particular project-specific questions. They are not really uh, fine-tuned to a specific discipline or even a program. They are more really broad questions that are going to be interesting and could lead to five, 10-year research programs down the line that could become themes for funding opportunities, that could become research projects or programs on their own. Yeah, and is that what the commission had in mind when they asked for this work? Because I that's... certainly hope so, because this is what we <laughs> that's did. That's what they're getting. <laughs> oh, right. Well, yeah, but that's what, I mean, I was going to ask, and I still am going to ask. So at what level of the EU policy process are you advising? It sounds like you're saying it's less to inform imminent policy and more to inform future funding priorities. Deciding what to fund next. It is for those Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe type of programs that are multi-year funding opportunities in the future, forward looking and thinking, what is it that the community wants to do? So again, it's this kind of bottom up perspective of, okay, we do know what we can fund right now because all of our funding agencies, our member countries, our partners have a particular mandate and they know where they can put money. But is that in line with what the community wants to do, where the research is going, where they see the interesting questions coming in or what they want to do? So to bring that together, we were kind of relying on on this really fine-tuned machine that already Danielle is leading, where we do have this, all right, let's gather all the information from the bottom up. What does the community want to do? But then still have that little bit of oversight on like, all right, well, this it's not everything that funders can do. There are strings, there are restrictions. And the editorial board with their expertise saying, oh, well, this is done already. Maybe this particular person who provided that question um, doesn't realize that elsewhere in the world, this topic has been already really well explored. And maybe that research can be pulled together or spread over geographically. Mm. And so it sounds like you've taken the template process from, from 10 new insights, but then you've adapted so both the, the theme and the purpose and the timing. Exactly. We, we used the process and had to be a little bit more agile. We had to go back to the drawing board and realize, all right, we don't have all of that time. Oh, we cannot actually have that kind of committee. We have to work with the people. We don't have the, the support of that mechanism that the secretariat provides for writing the 10 new insights. So we have to work with much smaller teams that can come together um, and way more globally as well. Um, so it was a lot of uh, going back to the drawing board and realizing, okay, this works, this doesn't work, and putting it together, a little bit building the airplane while we were flying it, because the timeline that we had was still just as short as 10 New Insights has, but they have that machinery, and we had to change our machinery a little bit. Um, definitely a different topic as well. And um, I think ultimately, we did learn a lot about how difficult it is to put together something in such a short amount of time and really trust the information that's in there. So there is a lot of learning and trust that happens throughout the year as well. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And are you interacting with the commission as you go along or are you just like producing the thing and giving it to them at the end? We do have periodic check-ins. Um, and they wanted to make sure, they wanted to know about the process. They wanted to know um, in the middle of the year, how are things going? Um, and they also receive a draft and they know what are the insights. They also had really specific questions to us. Um, particularly, they wanted to make sure that we are incorporating social science perspectives because if the themes that they have given us, conservation, biodiversity science, usually are more natural science focused, but they 
wanted that social science perspective as well. So those kinds of hints were important for us to make sure that we are also on the right track for what they want. Okay. And this might be an impossible question to answer or, or a painful question to answer. You tell me. But is this going to be a one-off or will it be like 10 new insights and become a repeatable thing? It's, um, as I said, it was a learning process. And one of the things that we learned is that it requires a lot of resources and human resources and time are really valuable. So I think we are very open and uh, we enjoyed the process, but at the same time also identified um, what is needed to make this successful and repeatable. Okay, so then taking a more general view now on, on, on both of these projects and maybe other projects like them, how does this kind of science advice work fit into the broader landscape of things that policymakers have to take on board. I mean, thinking, for instance, about climate change negotiators, but of course it's also true at EU level, I'm sure anywhere where policy is made, really. There's so much information coming in, not just evidence, also economic considerations, political considerations, negotiating tactics, compromises, personal opinions, instincts, and all this stuff. What do you offer the policymaker or the negotiator that stops you getting crowded out or that stops your work becoming, you know, briefing paper number 455 in a big pile that never gets looked at. Yeah, for the 10 new insights, I guess, what we hope is is that it's precisely what you're pointing out now that creates the need for something like 10 new insights. It's just there is too much. The, the, the IPCC is humongous. You get constantly, uh, I mean, the amount of publications as almost with anything in science just keeps going, but there's just a lot of noise. There's so much. So what we hope that we are getting close to is positioning as something that kind of can help to cut a little bit across the noise and and, and see that it's a, a very broad uh, exercise from scientists just focusing of all this, maybe pay attention to this thing. And then that's one aspect, providing a, a it's not a starting point, it's just kind of, given that time is limited, start here <laughs> kind of document. And then also increasingly so, I was describing this process of, of the careful crafting of the messaging, I'm hoping that it also will uh, arm the negotiators and, and policymakers that really want to carry this, like give them like very solid uh, messaging that they can trust that is very, very well grounded in the science, but it's also a messaging that is aware of the policy discussions that all the kind of um, competing needs that policymakers have to deal with, that is aware of the um, geopolitical <laughs> context. So I, I'm hoping that in that way, it becomes very useful for them. And I think there is another aspect there where we know that by the time the cop rolls around, all the negotiation has been done behind the doors. And it's, it's a lot of the lawyers who are there. They are just dotting those I's and crossing the T's and they are done. And then we have an outcome of that negotiation. But next to it, we can also show look, this is what the lawyers have come up with, but this is what the science says. And even if there is a little bit of conflict there or friction, that is useful for the discussion and what comes next and in the future. So I do not think that it is necessarily a problem that it is not in the lawyer's pockets so early on. They can still use it and say, all right, this is where the negotiation let us. Everything is a negotiation. All of that is useful information. But there's just something else that uh, just came to my mind is um, two things. One thing is I've reduced my obsession also with being too focused on the COP, so the next COP and how these this insights get through the next COP. It's like, as I said, it immediately continues with the next. The results from last year are still going to be relevant for some discussions this year. So we need to get better also on kind of making like constant conveyor belt. <laughs> if that's a good analogy, that we, we keep hammering some of the insights from last year. So now they are actually very early on the process for the year cycle because we already have them from the beginning of the year. And, and hopefully the ones that we're going to finalize in the next half of this uh, year make it to, to some minds uh, for COP29, but surely for the next one. And then a second thing is uh, last year there was this very interesting uh, situation when when the the president of COP28, or so, some recordings were released of, of some events some weeks before in which he said something to the effect of, oh, the, the need to phase out fossil fuels doesn't have a science basis to it. And it was this big scandal. It, was, uh, it came out of the, of the Guardian, was the one that put these things up. And it came in a very kind of 
uh, hot moment of, of COP. And um, WCRP and Future Earth, there were people from, from both organizations at COP and they got together when this happened, what do we do? And very much uh, building on the on the long meticulous work of messaging uh, and of synthesis that we have been doing with the with the ten new insights months before, we quickly put together uh, a statement. It was called something like statements from scientists at COP. It was really a thing of beauty. How quickly so many scientists just kind of said like, yeah, these are the key things. Put together this statement, and in a matter of hours, uh, hundreds of of high-level scientists had signed it, and a few days afterwards, it was 1,300 or so. And it was only possible because we had work on the messaging and were sure of some of the bases. So it was a very, it was relatively easy discussion to, to get on the edges. It was a couple of rounds in, in, in 24 hours. Uh, so that was more the, the, the function, not of getting into what the lawyers ended up putting in the end, but of... Uh, holding the, the feet to the ground, especially when these people talk about what science says or not said. A little bit of checks and balances there um, with, with the science. Mm -hmm. So with climate change, you have a particular set of circumstances that I can see make the kind of work that you do very important and very impactful. OK, so you have high attention from the public and from policymakers. You have a lot of science being done all the time. You have high stakes and you have like an obvious practical application targeting negotiations. And I guess you did for the work for the European Commission, you have some of that too. And, and, and there the stakes are like funding decisions, you know, multi-billion euro funding decisions. So I wonder whether this model or a model similar to this is transferable to other areas, other areas of science, I mean, or science advice. So maybe areas where these similar conditions also apply, or perhaps these conditions aren't required and actually this kind of model could be used anywhere. What do you think? Should we all be doing this kind of stuff? I think this is a very agile process that you can take and use in whatever discipline or field you would like to use it for. And particularly for funders, the process of scoping out what is the interesting hut most impactful field uh, for their dollars, what they can leverage, what has the global impact, what other funders and other researchers are interested in, is going to be um, a really good use of their time. So these processes exist. They have existed in the natural sciences. They, they definitely exist in social sciences. The integration of the two of them is really important now, more and more. And this model works for that. Just get all the input from many different sources and then try to synthesize, put a synthesis on those inputs, on those ideas, really, and see, okay, what emerges as a program, as a theme, as an insight, whatever word you want to use. This is something that you can keep on doing as long as you want as a conveyor belt using the same method all the time or adapt it to different ideas. What do you think, Daniel? Yeah, no, I, I I think it definitely works for different topics. And and I think all stemming from the same issue um, that I mentioned, this <clears throat> massive amount of exponential <laughs> growth of uh, publications in all areas of science. Uh, so for all areas that would be particularly policy relevant, they would be faced with a similar issue if there's just too much. So if there's a process that is, uh, that is kind of tried and tested, that has uh, offers some type of confidence that is robust, that it represents really a variety of uh, sources of science. It could be, I don't see why it couldn't be used in, in other, for other type of areas. And, and I would say I've been joking a lot in the past years that almost, almost like the process should be patented or trademark or something, because how often I get like this just request, like, could you walk us through how the process is? Because we have this and this. As it happened with the, uh, this request from the commission, uh, it has been for many different things. And, and it is also some of the most gratifying thing to describe uh, how the process is and, and what we have learned in the past years about it. So, yeah. Yeah, good. Well, I hope there is an academic article down the road based on that process too, in fact, written by a secretariat staff. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. yeah, we have a pretty good sample size now too, right? And multiple years redoing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, actually, maybe something uh, from my... I, I, was, I was doing a PhD 
before I started with Future Earth and I kind of, I was not happy with it and I took a step out of it and, and I thought th there was an, a job uh, offer at Future Earth that was supposed to be four months. And this was more than two years ago. <laughs> uh, but uh, why I mention it is because I sometimes think of going back to some other version of my PhD that would be much more focused on this science synthesis for policymakers and and how how to make that thing uh, more more effective and uh, and I I've been thinking of using this as a case study not because I think it's the absolute most successful thing but because I have learned so much of assumptions of how this work and and how to not fall uh, uh, prey of those assumptions thinking that I don't know policymakers are just going to take up the report and oh be enlightened and then apply but but how how much more you have to to think think through the interface for it to have any chance of of having an effect so yeah i uh, that could be a paper <laughs> for that phd yeah. i actually thought about that when you were asking a little bit about you know why would these researchers and scientists know how to inform policymakers and i thought about the secretariat the future secretariat the people who are working here a lot of them have a science PhD, but they are no longer active researchers. Some of them are, some of them aren't. And there are various reasons for that. But one of the things that they can do is that they themselves are these boundary spanning individuals, somebody who can take that scientific knowledge and they can distill things and they can write, they can communicate, they can talk to a scientific audience, they can talk to the policymakers. They can negotiate with the funders and say, all right, I can do this for you. This is how I would do it. This is my process. These are the people I would engage as a coordinator, as somebody who can bring together the different voices. And that's a very different skill. That's a different case. And that's why I like that term, boundary spanning. It's one of the ways I ended up here. I'm you know, not really using a zoology PhD. Um, I was in the science policy field working with funders for a couple of years before coming here where I get to do both. I can play with the science policy field. I can also work with scientists still very, very closely. And I'm there in between, still super close to the cutting edge science, but it's not me who has to do it or gets to do it. But still, it's a very rewarding position to be in. Yeah, I can really see that. And the enthusiasm with which you both talk about it. It's clear to see. This has been a fantastic conversation. So thank you for jumping so virtuosically from fascinating close detail to the very broad sweep of why this stuff works and why it's important. It's clearly important and exciting work. And I'm really grateful you took the time to share it with us. So thank you very much indeed, Judith Ungvari and Danielle Ospina. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it was my pleasure. The Science for Policy podcast is created by the Scientific Advice Mechanism to the European Commission. It's produced and presented by Toby Wardman, with additional editing by Nina Skorczak. The Scientific Advice Mechanism provides evidence-based expertise and policy recommendations to inform policymaking in the European Commission. This podcast is funded by the EU via the SAPEA Consortium. Our theme music is composed by Carlo Alfredo Piatti and performed by Elisabetta Shushenko.